Getting OpenMP up to speed, a few words about myself so you know who I am. I work in the Spark organization, and uh, my manager is responsible for architecture and performance. He basically uh, decides on the roadmap of the processors, and I'm one of his performance people. And I focus on OpenMP. That's me in a nutshell. And um, our team is based in Santa Clara. I spend my time everywhere, um, but a fair amount of time there as well. The real title of the talk is this one. OpenMP does not scale. But I wouldn't like that to be found in Google searches with my name attached to it, so I give it a fairly neutral name. Okay. But this is really what I want to talk about. So there's an agenda, a very simple agenda. Um, and I have an awful lot of slides, so let's get started. So there's a myth. And in good science, before we start, we need to define what we're talking about. And what we're talking about is a myth, and I looked it up, and a myth says, in popular use, it's something widely believed, but false. And here's the myth. There's few things that get me excited as quickly as possible as saying something like this. Um, think about it. A programming model cannot not scale. Many things cannot scale. The implementation cannot scale. Maybe the hardware, maybe the software, maybe the compiler, maybe you. And we'll talk about that. So what does that really mean? And I'll explain the, um, the meaning of that um, footprint at the end. So what does that mean? And what I'm going to show you is an imaginary discussion with an imaginary person that comes to me and says, OpenMP does not scale. Okay. And I'll show you a part of the conversation, and I think from the context it's clear what, I'll, what I'm talking about. So you come to me, you say, OpenMP does not scale. So I would ask you, so what I think you're trying to say is you wrote a parallel program, you used OpenMP, and it doesn't perform. I think that's really what you say when you say OpenMP does not scale. Okay. So, did you make sure that your program was fairly well optimized in sequential mode, running on one thread? Because if your program does not run well on one thread, what do you think will happen on 10, or 20, or 100, or 1,000? Do you think it'll go better? I don't think so. Okay. You didn't. Why do you think the program should scale then? You just think it should. Okay. You used all the cores. Did you use Amdahl's law? No, that's not a new EU bailout program. That's something else. I know you can't know everything, but have you at least used the tool to find out where you're spending most of your time? You didn't. You just parallelized all the loops in your program. Did you try to avoid inner parallelizing the innermost loops then? You didn't. Did you perhaps minimize the number of parallel regions? You didn't. It just worked fine the way it was. So did you use the no-weight clause to minimize the use of the barriers? Because barriers are expensive. Oh, you never heard of a barrier. No, maybe, maybe you should read a little bit. Um, do all the threads perform the same amount of work, roughly? You don't know. You think it's OK. Well, I hope you're right. Did you maximize the use of private data, or you, did you share most of it? Oh, you, oh you, you just shared. It's easier. Sure. Looks like you're using a CC NUMA system. Did you take that into account? Never heard of that either. Hmm. Maybe, maybe it was false sharing affecting performance. <laughs> Never heard of that either. Maybe, maybe you should read a little bit more. Okay. So what did you do next? To address, you clearly have a performance problem, so what did you do next? Oh, you switched to MPI. I see. Does that perform any better? Oh, you don't know. You're still debugging the code. All right. <laughs> well, while you're waiting for that run to finish, let me... Oh, by the way, you sure it doesn't hang? <laughs> um, let, me, let me talk a little bit more about OpenMP and performance. So while we're waiting, we go into into OpenMP and performance. And I call this section Deep Trouble for a good reason. Uh, because OpenMP is absolutely easy to use, no doubt about it. It doesn't mean you can stop thinking. That's the mistake people make. And um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So it looks so easy, 
you type it in and it runs in parallel and you don't get the performance you expect to see. Okay, and uh, again, that's what I'll talk about. So the ease of use has a price and the price is that it may mask performance problems. And again, I'm going to talk about those. Um, so hopefully you all get good performance, but maybe few of you are disappointed. And for those, we'll have a lot more slides. So there are two things that really impact performance and you don't see it. And are CC NUMA and false sharing. The funny thing is, they have nothing to do with OpenMP. One day when I have some more time, I'll show you a POSIX threads program with exactly the same problems that I'll be talking about. Again, it has nothing to do with OpenMP. It's the shared memory system. That, that's the underlying shared memory system that has some strange things that we need to talk about. Again, And I'll show you in OpenMP how you, can, how you can run into it and how you can avoid it. But again, keep in mind, if you would switch some, to some other shared memory model, POSIX threads or whatever, you, may s you probably see the same things. So. Um, it's, all, it's all basically all because we have cache-based systems and because of the memory bandwidth, we have these CC NUMA architectures. Okay, so. First of all, false sharing. I know Christian mentioned it a couple of times already, uh, but I'm not sure everybody was there when he gave uh, those talks earlier this week. So let me quickly review what is false sharing. As you probably know by now, in the system, cache lines go back and forth all the time. And here in my imaginary example, I have two caches, two CPUs or cores. And for whatever uh, reason, one cache line lives in three different places. And the reason is very simple. Uh, the cache line will always start in memory. And what if this CPU needs the blue element? It will get that cache line. And if this one needs the yellow element, it will get the same cache line. It wants to have a different element, but they happen to be in the same cache line. So this is a very natural situation to have. It can easily happen. The problem is when that CPU changes, let's say, the yellow element, now I have two different versions of my cache line. And that change is propagated throughout the system. Note here there's some extra color here. That's, uh, those are called the state bits. The state bits describe the status of the line, like it's clean, you can use it, it's dirty, you can't use it. And those, those change when you modify an element. And uh, roughly at about the same time, the system will mark the other copies as invalid. Okay. That's called cache coherence. That's what cache coherence does. So you know this is the most recent version of my cache line. Okay. That's why you do it. Now there's a problem with that. If many threads read the same line many, many times. Modify, I should say, not read. Because each time you do that, those bits will change and the line is invalid. So you need to get a new line from somewhere and the lines will start traveling through your system. And if that happens too often, it'll slow you down. Big time slow you down, actually. False sharing has a fairly big impact on performance. So, with the following in the following scenario, you should be alert. You're talking about shared data that's being modified. This only starts when you store, when you write into the cache line. Multiple threads do that at the same time and roughly on the same cache line or maybe two cache lines. So you have a very small portion of memory and they're all hitting it and they all want to modify it. Then that line will be copied throughout the whole system and, and you notice that in performance. This is why we recommend in OpenMP to use local or private data where you can. Because when you have the private data, nobody else will know about it. That's great. That's what you want. So one of the golden rules for MPI, OpenMP and performance is to only use shared data when you have to. The rest you should make private. Okay. And again, you'll see examples along the way. Uh, keep in mind, if, if you have read-only data, it's fine. You can have gigabytes of read-only data, nothing will happen. You can share that, that's no problem. It's when you modify the data. So that's false sharing. Okay. Now about CC NUMA. Uh, again, Christian mentioned it several times as well, so here's my, my, uh, my view on CC NUMA. Here's an imaginary architecture. I have uh, two processors or cores, 
and as I said, uh, the characteristic of ZC Numa is, is that each processor owns a portion of the memory. In this case, half. Half of the memory is connected to one processor, the other half to the other one. And you glue that together with an interconnect that understands this cache coherence. It understands the changes in the cache lines. Okay. The question is, how do you distribute your data? So here's some data in the CPU on the, on the left-hand side. And if I access that from my own processor, if the thread is running on the processor on the left-hand side, I'm fine. That's the fastest I can get. But what if I'm running on the other side of the system? Then I need to travel. The access request will have to travel through the system, and I need to get my data. That takes longer. And that's why it's called NUMA, non-uniform memory access. It depends on where your data is. And that's a situation you'd like to avoid if you can. So this is definitely important. And again, you'll see more examples along the way. And if, you, if it's not optimal, it will impact your, not only your performance, but also your scalability. There's another thing. In the previous picture, if all your data is on one memory, all the threads try to go through it, and that memory controller will be overloaded. So you'll, you'll have multiple bottlenecks in your system. Luckily, finally, OpenMP 4.0 that, that came out last year has support for CC NUMA. And I saw on the agenda that's a topic that will be talked about, and I think that's a very important one. So you'll hear all about uh, NUMA support in OpenMP. The main uh, concept is called OMP Places, but again, you, you'll hear a lot about it in the remainder of this workshop. So what if I don't do anything? What will the operating system decide? Because placement is always under control of the operating system. It's the one that decides where your data will go. So what I need to do is I need to make the OS my friend, not my enemy. And by default, all the operating systems, and I think that holds for AIX as well, IBM's AIX, is they use what is called first touch. And first touch, this is exactly what the name suggests. The thread that accesses the data for the first time will own it. And technically, it's uh, the one that sets up what's called a TLB entry. But for you, it means the thread that like, initializes the data for the first time. It will own that data. Okay, that's called first touch. Okay. And you can change that if you like, but you need to, you need to check the documentation. So here's an example. A very simple loop, I initialize a vector to zero, and for cosmetic reasons, I, I restrict that loop to be 100 long, but that doesn't matter. That's just for point of the illustration. So I want to initialize 100 elements to zero. If I wouldn't do anything, and, and I would execute it like that, as you, you learned this morning, one thread, like the master thread, will execute that loop. And that means that that one owns the data because that's what I just said. The one that initializes the data for the first time will own it. That's maybe not what I want, because now I have that potential bottleneck and remote access times. Okay. But that's what first touch does. First touch actually makes sense, because when you have a non-parallel program, this is exactly what you want. So you have to make a choice as an operating system, so uh, it does make sense, but it's, again, it's not always what you like to get. There's a very easy way to change that. With one line open in pragma, I can let this loop run in parallel. And again, for demonstration purposes, I use two threads for that. So now, one thread will initialize the first 50 elements of A, and the other one, the other 50. That's what you kind of learned this morning. You will distribute the work over the threads. So now, they'll get half of the data. Very simple. It's not more complicated than that. Now, you will see some complications along the way, but this is the basic idea. So I hope that's, that's clear. Uh, one, uh, one simplification in this slide is that the allocation is on the page level. So fairly big chunk of memory. A, a, an operating system page is four kilobyte on Intel, and like on Spark, it's eight kilobyte. So it's not on a very fine-grained basis. It's at the page level. So now I let first touch do the magic for me. 
Okay. In the remainder of this talk, I want to show some real-world cases. Uh, we'll start easy. A climate modeling application written in Fortran and um, parallelized with OpenMP. And it landed on my desk because somebody said it doesn't scale well. Okay. Uh, input files, about 500 megabyte of data, fairly small memory footprint, only 8 gigabytes, so by now that's, that's not that big. And again, scalability, and you'll see the, the numbers in a few seconds, was disappointing, and that was on a non-CC NUMA system. That was a machine with flat memory access, so can't be CC NUMA. Question to you, well, what if this is your application? What would you do next? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. The first thing I did, I ran the program and I could compile with, without the OpenMP option, so the OpenMP was ignored, and I run on a single thread, and then I take the OpenMP version and run it on one thread. In the good case, these two numbers are the same, roughly the same. In the bad case, this one is higher because with OpenMP I, I create overhead. So the more overhead I have, the bigger the difference is. So this number, these two green numbers shows that the OpenMP overhead is pretty low. So whoever parallelized this did a good job in making the OpenMP part efficient. But when you look at the speed up, as I add threads from 2, 4, 8, all the way to 24, the speed up starts to slow down. On two threads, I get 1.84 speed up, then 3.2, not so bad. But on 8, it's 5. So you see that Amdahl's law curve showing up here. So it starts to slow down. You can actually, and I won't go into the details of that, you can actually estimate what you would see, and it pretty much follows the estimate. OK, again, what if this was your application? Step 1, make a profile. Always use a tool to find out where the time is spent. Whatever you want to use, fine with me but make sure that you know where the time is spent. You wouldn't be the first one that optimizes the wrong part of their application. Because from your physics or chemistry point, you think, oh, that's really important. But to the computer, it could be a totally different part of your program. So always make a profile, step number one. And here I'm comparing the profile on two and four threads. And it's a little bit hard to read, um, but what I see is there's a thing called, this is our profile, it tells me the OpenMP idle time is quite high. Idle time means, in, in our profile, it means there's no work for the threads. Okay, that's the first information that I get. Uh, the barrier cost is fairly low, so that's not so bad. Okay. We have a feature called the timeline where we show the color-coded um, execution of your program. The light green bar is the operating system view, and any, any other color than green is bad news. Now green is good. So from the OS point of view, this application is fine. The next bar with all the colors is, is the application, and each function gets a different color. So you can see it goes through different stages. That's on one thread. Then I go to two threads, and you see the time is reduced. The time is from left to right, and I go to four. Again, the time is reduced, but it's not as not in cut by half. Okay. So it, again, this confirms the scalability. What I did then, I took that tool, and I made every function green, uh, gray, sorry, other than the OpenMP idle, because remember, that one was expensive. And that's the red. It's a little hard to see here, but you see all this little red here. That means there's no work for these threads. They got nothing to do. Why? That's the next question you want to answer. Why is there no work for those threads? And um, I zoom in, and what I show you here, this is a four-threaded run. The red, again, means idle, no work. And this is the master thread. The master thread always runs. So the master thread, you'll always see the master thread being active. So what you see here, you see the pink and the light green and the blue. That's what the master thread is doing while there's no work for the other threads. And here, for example, you go parallel. That, that's what you want to see. You don't want to see this. Again, I, I hope that's, that's clear, especially for the people new to parallel programming and, and OpenMP. Okay. What I did, I, um, the blue color actually turns out to be I.O. So what this program is doing, 
when you look at it, it's, there's, a, there's a parallel portion, but before the parallel portion, there's I.O. and no other thread is doing anything. That's bad news. Again, think about Amdahl's law. So that's not good news. And when you zoom out, you see that that's the same pattern. Parallel and before the parallel I.O. and then parallel I.O. So that's something to, as if this was your application to think about, maybe you can do something about that. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a little bit funny. The first um, 10 seconds of this program was special. So um, I wondered, even on four threads, why do I only get two threads doing something in the beginning? Well, that was a loop only too long. Do I 1, 2? Sometimes things are very easy, so no matter how many threads you use, you'll never get more than two threads active. Okay. Um, when I zoom in on the performance, I again, I see that red, the OMP idle, being, um, being fairly, um, fairly high. And here is where I start looking at each function side by side. So these are the functions, and I have no idea what they're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a mathematician, not some <laughs> chemistry guy or whatever. But what I see here is these are the functions, and they take a certain amount of time. And for example, the orange one, convection, it takes 20%, about 3,000 seconds, and about 1,700 seconds on two threads. So scalability is not so bad, not so bad. Not perfect, but not so bad. So you can go through the list, and for each one of them, you can check what's going on and find a bad one. And then as you add the number of threads, increase them to up to 16, I saw these, and the layout is a little bit funny, that's a font issue, but what this, this says, this, the time is always the same, no matter how many threads I use. Well, that's Amdahl's law. This is the non-parallel part of my program. And as you see here, already on 16 threads, it's killing my performance. That's why we always talk about Amdahl's law, because the impact is, is substantial. Okay. That's easy. The next thing is to see if you can fix it, but okay. Okay, again, that was warming up. Um, next example, very simple algorithm. It's my favorite because it's so simple and there's so much in it. Multiplying a matrix, a vector by a matrix. Here's the standard way to write that in C, just that you take the in C, you would take the dot product of the row of the matrix times the vector. In Fortran, you would take the linear combination of the columns. In, in Fortran, you would do it differently. By the way, who's, who's programming in Fortran here? Okay, so I assume the rest is C, C++? Okay, good, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I always have to pick a language with my examples, uh, but I hope the Fortran people can uh, still relate to, to this. So in C, you would like to take the dot products of the matrix times the vector. And all these dot products are independent. So it's very parallel. It's a very parallel algorithm. And uh, first of all, any automatically parallelizing compiler will do this for you. But if you do it yourself with OpenMP, it's only one line. It's literally, this is literally from my source. It's only one parallel for pragma, and this will run in parallel. There's no selling here. If you would type this in, that's what would happen. So I ran it. I ran it on, an, on a certain Intel system. And uh, what I'm showing you is the performance in floating point operations per second. So higher is better. The faster I go, the higher my uh, megaflop number or gigaflop number is as a function of the matrix size. So I take a very small matrix and I make it larger and larger and larger. And I do that for a, a certain combination of threads, like one thread, two, four, eight, and 16. So what you see, this is the single thread performance. That's this kind of bluish line. And for a while, the parallel version is actually slower. So when you have a very small matrix, the overhead of OpenMP is just too much. Now this is a very small matrix, but there is overhead. So that shows. You wouldn't like to use two or more threads on these very small matrices. There are ways around it. 
and again, I'd love to talk about it later, but uh, that's what you would uh, measure if you would uh, not do anything special. But then, after a while, the multiple threads start to pay off. It, it, it gets faster. And here in this region, I get a very nice speed up. It's actually a more than linear speed up. In this part of the, of the curve, like here I go from um, about 5,000 to, yeah, the, the, this is 4,000, 8,000, almost linear kind of speed up. So very nice numbers. The bad point is here. No speed up at all. After the initial speed up from one to two threads, no matter how many threads I use, nothing happens. And that's too bad because usually you want to parallelize because you're solving a large problem, not one that runs in 10 milliseconds. So what's going on here? We need to get a little bit technical. And we need to look at the architecture. This is the architecture. This was a machine with two sockets. There's a lot of detail in here, but uh, each socket has four cores. Each core supports two hardware threads. But it's a CC NUMA system because each, each uh, socket has a portion of the memory. And the Intel interconnect is called QPI, Quick Path Interconnect. That's a cache coherent interconnect, but it is a CC NUMA architecture. I hope that's clear from the diagram. And I, I ignored that when I wrote my OpenMP. Well, think about my first touch, simple example. What that said was that you need to make sure that the data is in the right memory when you initialize it. So what you do, and like in this, and this is a fairly easy case, you do reverse engineering. How am I going to use the data when I do my matrix vector algorithm? And how do I want to have it laid out in the memories? And that's, that's what I changed in my code. So, for example, here, when you look at the matrix, what I do, and there's a lot of code here, but essentially what I do, I initialize the matrix in parallel over the rows. So the rows are distributed over the memories because that's how I'll be using it. I'll be reading the rows of the matrix when I do my computation. Again, some reverse engineering. This is a fairly easy case. Um, I did um, parallelize in, yeah, the, the, the array, the vector, sorry, C. Each thread will read all of that vector, C, but why would I put it on one memory? Why, why wouldn't I distribute that over the system as well? So that's why I have this initialization here. Okay. Probably a very small effect, but it's a different way of thinking. So what, what will happen here on two threads, one um, socket will have half of the vector and the other one will have the other half, so I get better use of my memory bandwidth. Okay. Same ideas for the matrix. Uh, paranoid as I am, I also did that for the result vector A because that will have to go through a cache and memory as well. Okay, that's a very small change. Okay, so with this change, I got much more scalability on larger matrices. Eventually, the system runs out of bandwidth. But again, uh, remember, it wouldn't scale to more than two threads. Now I start to see benefit. I didn't change my algorithm. I only changed the way I place my data. Um, I did the same experiment just to show you that this is generic on a Spark machine. On the Spark machine, um, we have uh, some kind of interesting way of doing the hardware threading. The idea is the following. While one thread executes, there's often times that you wait for a cache miss or something or whatever, memory miss. And if you have multiple of those threads running, well, why not interleave them so I reduce the gaps? So you interleave the execution. Okay. That's how the threading works on the Spark. A little detail, if you want to know more, again, I love to talk about it, and there's a white paper about it as well. Here's the Spark machine that I used, a somewhat older machine, a T42, a two-socket system. And by design, I make it very much look similar to the Intel architecture. Now, some people will hate me for doing that, but um, from a performance point of view, they're very similar. We have different number of threads, and there's more cores and whatever, but at the end of the day, both have a portion of the memory. 
both RCC NUMA architectures. So, I see the same on the Spark machine. I, I run out of steam. If I don't optimize for CC NUMA, I take my CC NUMA version and I get a benefit. Again, it's a generic optimization. And when you summarize it, both architectures, let me see uh, which one is which. Um, on, the, um, on the Intel system, I got about 2.1x and on the Spark about 1.9. So roughly I got a 2x performance gain by thinking about my data layout. Welcome to CC NUMA. Okay. We'll go a little bit deeper now. I, I, hope, I hope you're still with me. <laughs> and, uh, I know there are two doors in this, in this room, so. <laughs> okay, um, a Fortran example. Uh, reduced from the real case to what contained the, to be the heart of the, the problem. A three-dimensional matrix update. The matrix is called X. And when you look at the matrix, um, you see there's uh, indices i, j, and k. But i, j, and k depends on i, j, k minus 1. So this one depends on this one. And it depends on that one. So I have two dependencies when I look at that one statement there. To compute this point, I need the other two. That means I cannot parallelize over those dimensions. I cannot parallelize the do j loop or the do k loop because I have a data dependence. And uh, again, if you see this for the first time, that may be puzzling and I'd love to explain it in detail, but you can't parallelize the loop over j or k. You would get a wrong answer because there's ordering in it. Luckily, I can parallelize the do i loop because that's a regular vector vector type of op operation. So, simple one line, again, one line open MP directive, and I'm done. There's one little catch here. At the end, as Christian said, at the end of the parallel region, there's an implied barrier, and that's fairly expensive. So, there's a barrier here that will be executed about n squared times. So, you would not expect this to scale well because of the cost of the barrier. So I ran it, and it didn't scale well. You know, this actually scales quite badly. <laughs> At eight, it will stop scaling. So that was what I, well, you never know where it will stop scaling, but I wasn't surprised it didn't scale very well. So I made a profile. Again, always make a profile. Use your favorite tool. And then I got very surprised, and I hope this is somewhat uh, reas uh, readable. What I'm doing here is I'm comparing the profile for one thread and two threads. One thread and two threads, and I'm looking at the CPU time. I'm looking at how much work I do in the OpenMP part, and how much time I wait. That's what our profiler tells you. And what I see in that profile, again, this is going fairly quick, but a lot of barrier time. That's what I expected because I didn't do a good job parallelizing that innermost loop. What I didn't expect was to see so much idle time because this is a vector operation. So I don't have any load balancing or whatever. Wh where does the idle time come from? And when I look at the source level, I see the same. I see the idle time from 18 milliseconds on um, one thread go up to more than two seconds. There's a huge increase in the idle time when you just add some threads. That's bad news. And when you look at that timeline, again, uh, the, the top bar is the operating system view. The, the other bars are the application view. I'll, again, I'll, I'll, I won't go into all the gory details, but all the red here is barrier and that's bad news. So there's bad news here in this profile. It doesn't, it doesn't look good from a performance point of view. Okay. Same when I increase the number of threads. So it's not a good profile. And um, then I noticed something. And let me see if I can show that. Uh, so 
the master thread is always running. This is the master thread on when I use two threads. And this is the second thread. And note all the barrier time and the idle time. So it looks like this one is always active and this one is most of the time waiting in the barrier or there's no work. And again, given from what I'm doing, that doesn't make any sense. Another thing I noticed is when I go to a higher thread count is this thread is fairly active, active in the barrier. And this one has more idle time. While this regular operation, would, you would expect a more regular profile. OK. So eventually I realized what it is. This is false sharing in the real world. I talked about it conceptually, but this is an example of false sharing. Because on one thread, I work on this long vector, the inner loop, do i from 1 to m, a vector of length m, no sharing. When I have two threads, I have the risk the cache line is accessed by two threads. When I go to four threads, there are three possible places where multiple threads access the same cache line. It's some sort of statistical thing. I didn't really do all the math behind it, but you would expect this to happen. And as you add threads, there's more false sharing. Because again, this means that two threads are interested in the same cache line. And what I said was that's bad news. And it is. And it shows. All these processors, I don't think there's any talk about that but um, in this workshop, but these processors have counters. And the counters are like a microscope into the CPU, what's going on. So what I looked at here is how often the cache line got marked invalid. Remember many slides ago when I had that line and the cross through it? This is counting how often that happens. And you see exponential growth as I add threads. That's a very clear sign of full sharing. There's no, unfortunately, no tool that I know of where you push a button and it'll say, oh yeah, you got full sharing. I wish it was there, but I don't know of any tool. If, if there is, I would like to know about it. If you're a tools person, that's a nice challenge. Um, but okay, so this kind of uh, measurement shows you there's full sharing happening. Okay, so then I got an idea. If, um, if, the, the, if there's independent in only one dimension, it means that the planes are independent. I can do this one in parallel with the other one here. I hope, I hope that's clear. Well, if I can do uh, that in parallel, I can do this. I can have each thread update a whole block and because there's no dependence between the blocks but I have to write that myself. So in terms of um, the coding, I need to figure out a start and end value for each thread. So they all have their own block to work on. It's a little bit of bookkeeping that you need to do. And that's shown here. This is straight from the code. I always call that the plus or minus one problem. I usually get it right almost the first time but there's a minus one missing or plus one. So it's not hard, you just need to figure out when I'm thread five, this is what I work on. When I'm thread six, this is what I work on. So you get some, some sort of logic like this again. I always need a couple of iterations to get it right, but eventually it works. And that's what this code is doing now. What this code is doing is one parallel region. I get the thread ID, again, as Christian talked about this morning, I get the thread ID and depending on who I am, I figure out what I should work on. Very, again, conceptually very straightforward. And here's the difference in performance. Now, the, the, the kind of the jig jack, the jigsaw thing here is uh, low balancing, so kind of ignore that. Um, what you see is a dramatic uh, improvement in performance, about four times faster. Um, so I looked at the, the timeline again, and the red is gone. So I got rid of all the barrier calls. I got rid of the, the bad things. Right. I still see a little bit of load imbalance on this, um, but yeah, so be it. And now look at, and remember the, those, uh, exponential, that exponential growth in the invalidations? 
the blue line, the blue chart is for the new version. Almost no invalidations anymore. So the false sharing is gone. Okay. So that was that was the solution, and then I got a little bit carried away, and I have another solution where I use OpenMP. This is this is a different solution of the same problem, um, where I one of the problems is I had that barrier inside. Remember, now I can get rid of it with the no weight, and by pushing the the parallel region out. That's a very common trick. A parallel region in OpenMP is quite expensive, so you push it out, and then I can leave the barrier out with the no weight. So this is just more efficient. It looks a little bit funny uh, when you see it for the first time. It looks funny when you see it for the second time, but eventually it starts to make sense, and uh, this is how it executes on two threads. Since I have the parallel region on the outside, both uh, threads, in, in the case of two threads, will start using k equals 2, j equals 2, they split the loop, and then they'll do the same for j equals 3, and j equals 4, and so forth. So again, it's a different version of this algorithm. So I have, essentially I have four different versions. I have the bad one that I started with, with all the false sharing and the barrier. Of course I tried the compiler on this. I have the one with the three-dimensional blocks, and the funny one that I was just showing. And here's the difference in performance. The, um, the blue one is the bad one. The red one is the one I had before. Uh, the, w the green one is the funny one that I was showing. And actually, for uh, lower thread counts, it does remarkably well. I didn't look into that, why that is, but it's interesting to see. But eventually, as I add more threads, the performance starts to flatten out. What is surprising is the compiler does very well. It actually detects this situation. I checked with our compiler team. It detects the situation and actually does what I did by hand. Quite impressive. So the message is never forget about your compiler and see what it can do for you. Especially in Fortran, it can do magic because Fortran is a relatively easy language to analyze. So if you use Fortran and you have these nice vector type of loops, use the compiler to automatically parallelize for you. It can save you a lot of work. Okay, I then uh, enabled the thing called software prefetch where you try to fetch memory before you need it. And um, yeah, I got some nice results. But what was really a surprise to me was that my original version without the software prefetch was faster than the one with the software prefetch. Software prefetch is where the system tries to fetch the data, the cache lines, before you need it. And you can do that in hardware and software. And in software, you control it through the compiler. It's often an option on the compiler. So I played with that. So initially, I, I um, I got a kind of nice performance, but eventually it scales less, and I had no idea why that was. I did not expect that. And that's welcome to the, the land of optimization. It's one big message I want to I wanna give all of you. Never give up if you need that performance. Just maybe let it rest for a week and get some other ideas, because this took me uh, really by surprise. Like, I don't know what's going on here. So I uh, went back to look at those hardware counters. Hardware counters are really good to show you what's going on deep inside the system. But it's rather expert stuff. So when you're from here, go to one of the, the people in the, in the team here and ask help. Um, because the hardware counters actually can give you a lot of valuable information. And here's what I saw when I used the counters. I'm looking at... Um, how many times I have a cache miss and my data is on the other node. That's the name of that uh, local miss remote hit. So it means I missed in the cache and I found it on another node. That's a CC NUMA thing. That's how you can find out whether you have too much CC NUMA traffic. And again, uh, the base version does quite well, but my so-called optimized version has a much higher miss ratio. 
In other words, my optimization made it worse from a CC NUMA point of view. Oh, that's a bummer. I mean, would it be nice if it did that as well, but no free lunch, I guess. So, so what's going on here? Well, now we have to get very technical. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll keep it short. Again, I'll be more than happy to talk about details. I'll be here the rest of the workshop. So, okay, here's my array X. And my array X is a three-dimensional array. And um, it depends on the language and the data structure, how it is stored in the memory. And this is Fortran, and Fortran stores along the columns. So the first column, first in the memory, then below that, the next column, and the next column, and then you go to the, the third dimension. So planes by planes. That's how Fortran stores um, its multi-dimensional structures. So one comma one is comma one is somewhere in, in memory. The next one in memory is two comma one comma one, and then three. So all the way to column. That's how it's stored in memory. Now I briefly mentioned that the operating system, the operating system doesn't know about cache lines or whatever. It only knows about pages. And a page is a big chunk of memory, on the scale of these things, like a kilobyte in our case. So a kilobyte per chunk. The pages follow the storage order. So the orange one is one page. The next one is the second page, and the third page, and the fourth page. And by design, on purpose, I show you it doesn't nicely align. So column one plus one element is in one page. That, of course, depends on the size of my matrix and the size of the page. Okay, this is a fake example, but that could happen. So that's how things are laid out in memory. This is how I access it. So what I do is here I access um, multiple pages, but some threads, or actually all of them, they compete for the same page. Thread zero and thread one, they both want to have this page. That's not a good situation. You really want to have the pages in your own memory, the CC NUMA idea. You really want to have it local, not scattered over the system. That's unfortunate, and um, actually I could only come up with a very ugly solution. Um, let's go back to the data structure, and actually the, the, yeah, this explains the, the new algorithm doesn't solve that problem. So the only solution for now I could come up with is to change my data structure, make it four-dimensional. I still need roughly about the same memory. I don't want to duplicate memory or whatever because that's not a good idea. But I organize it in a different way. So if this was your application, there could be a lot of work to reorganize your data structure. But here's my idea. My idea is, is to give a, a block of memory to each thread. And since this is shared, they can all read whatever they need. But I want to have the, the highest chance that your data is local. So that's what I did here, and uh, so the access now includes the thread idea. And to make it specific, this is what the new code looks like. The new array, I called it X2, has a fourth dimension, and the fourth dimension is the thread idea. Let's see, here I get the thread idea, and I use that. Again, that's a big change in my code, absolutely. And I'm open to better suggestions. <laughs> Okay, so that's how the algorithm changes. But now uh, we're going to look at the impact. First of all, remember those remote L3 hits, meaning I have to go to another socket, they're gone. They're almost gone in the new version. So I, I achieved my goal, luckily. Okay. And eventually, this the, that's the purple line, compared to where I was, it's much, much faster. So it pays off. Now, of course, then the question is, do you really want to do this if this is a one million line <laughs> source code? But uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing that can happen. That. Okay, so Christian could not believe I could finish on time, but I think I will, unless my watch stopped going. Um, okay, so okay, we're going back. So we're still waiting for your debug run to finish. And was it useful? 
it is overwhelming, I know. I think all of you need a break. That's another advantage I have. I can see all of your eyes. <laughs> so I know it's time for a break. Um, and it's absolutely unclear. Right? I'm the first one to admit. You know, this, and there's not much documented about this, these things yet. So I know that. You're not a computer scientist, you just need to get your job done and you have some research and you happen to use a computer and because the runtime is too long you need to use parallel computing to get an acceptable runtime. And sorry, but it's all about Darwin and uh, yeah, it's just a tough world out there. So, okay, great, your MPI job finished, that's really great. Oh, your program does not write a file called core and it wasn't there when you started the program. You wonder where it comes from. Well, let's talk, but let's do that over a coffee. What? What did you just say? Somebody told you what? GPUs and OpenCL will solve all your problems. Let's make that a triple espresso, and I will buy. Thank you very much. And remember, bad OpenMP does not scale. Thank you very much. It's time for the break.